It's a great privilege to have as our guest speaker, one of our own today, Dr. Robin Bigelow is going to speak on topical therapy of the ear. Give us from uh, history to current day settings. So Dr. Bigelow, thank you so much. Thank you. Like Dr. Slattery said, I'm talking about topical therapy for the ear, um, going from Hippocrates to the modern era. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Uh, objectives are an outline of the talk today. We're gonna um, start by talking about some of the common uses of eardrops, um, some of the um, disease processes that would require topical therapy like otitis externa, eczematous otitis, chronic otitis media with perforation and perioperatively. I'm gonna discuss the current topical ear therapies that are used today. Uh, a brief discussion about pricing of topical therapies and then historical eardrops and powders. Um, otitis externa, this will be a review for most people. Um, it's also known as swimmer's ear. Um, patients will present with otalgia, otorrhea, erythema, um, pain with palpation of the tragus or pinna. Um, three uh, may involve water exposure and or trauma to the ear, ear canal. Exceedingly common. Um, I was surprised to see um, between one in 100 and one in 250 uh, people in the US get otitis externa every year with a lifetime incidence up to 10%. Uh, most of these cases are treated in urgent care or primary care, but some of them make it to EMT or neurotology offices. The most common pathogens are Pseudomonas or Staph aureus. Um, infection is often commonly polymicrobial. The standard of care today is debridement, topical, antiseptics, antibiotics, with or without steroids, and earwick can be used to stent open a swollen ear canal and allow for deeper delivery of medication. Fungal otitis externa. Um, this accounts for about 10% of otitis externa cases, with the majority being bacterial. Uh, commonly, this is a fungal superinfection that can occur after treatment of bacterial otitis externa or after minor ear canal trauma. Most common pathogens are aspergillus followed by candida. The symptoms are similar to that seen in um, acute otitis externa, the bacterial variety, but tend to be a little bit more mild with otalgia, uh, more itching, and there can be a, a malodorous odorrhea. On exam, it's distinct from bacterial otitis um, with notable um, fungal hyphae present, sometimes with black um, fruiting bodies, which you can see a picture of on the right here. Uh, the treatment, um, again, recommended debridement and then acidifying agents and antifungals or gentian violet. Xematis otitis externa, this is a non-infectious non cause of chronic otitis. Uh, be due to an allergic contact reaction, um, or be idiopathic or related to other dermatologic conditions. Patients will report itching, um, irritation, and occasionally drainage. Um, on exam, you'll see a flaking dry um, scaly skin with an erythematous base. Um, this is best treated by avoiding triggers, oral toilet and cleaning, as well as topical anti-inflammatories. So topical therapy is also the first line treatment for acute or chronic otitis media with tympanic membrane perforation and otorrhea or tympanostomy tube otorrhea. Um, we all know that neurogotomy with tympanostomy tube placement is one of the most common surgical procedures performed in the United States. Uh, Pre-COVID, it was estimated at 700,000 procedures yearly um, and drops are frequently prescribed after tympanomastoid surgery as well. It's hard to find updated data on this, but in 2004, there were an approximately 7.5 million prescriptions for topical ear therapies. So it's a very common uh, medication and type of medication that's used. Uh, so topical antibiotic therapy is um, very effective. Um, there's been a study looking at oral um, or IV antibiotics and the concentration that's achieved in middle ear fluid. And what the authors found was between one and 35 micrograms per milliliter of the antibiotic was present in the middle ear after um, 
administration by a systemic route over topical antibiotics can achieve a much higher local concentration. Uh, for instance, a 0.3% solution of an antibiotic drop, which is the most common um, concentration used um, commercially today, um, has 3,000 micrograms per milliliter, uh, which is about 100 times uh, stronger than the concentration that can be achieved with systemic therapy. And there's some research done out of a group at Stanford that was looking at um, what concentration of antibiotic is required to uh, eliminate either free bacteria or bacteria within a biofilm. Uh, they looked at alfoxacin as well as some other topical preparations um, and tested against pseudomonas, two strains of pseudomonas and two strains of staph aureus. And you can see for free bacteria, the um, amount of antibiotic that was required to uh, treat the disease was between one and 100 uh, micrograms per milliliter, so well within the range of what can be achieved with topical therapy. Um, however, occasionally outside of uh, what can be treated with systemic therapy. Now, the story is a little bit different when there's a biofilm. Um, there's strains of pseudomonas that are resistant to even high concentrations of topical antibiotics. Um, and that's probably responsible for some of the um, difficult cases that are um, asymptomatic during treatment, but when they come off of treatment, they will have recurrent otorrhea. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about some of the um, commercially available products today. Um, acidifying agents are useful for prophylaxis against recurrent infections or can be used for mild otitis externa or fungal otitis externa. Um, they should not be used when tympanic membrane perforations are present due to potential ototoxicity. Um, if cost is an issue, you can recommend patients make their own um, acidifying agent at home with um, white vinegar and alcohol and water. Um, commercially available preparations include Fosol, um, Fosol HC, which includes uh, steroid and demoboro. Antiseptic agents, so um, a variety of things have been used um, in the past as antiseptic for ear. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little mostly about probidone iodine. Um, as we know, this is a commonly used um, prep for ear surgery and in other surgeries as well. Um, most of the antiseptic agents are ototoxic and have been tested and proven to be such in animal models. Um, one study looked at um, the probidone iodine scrub and found that to be highly ototoxic at nearly every concentration tested, but the probidone iodine prep at 10% was only mildly ototoxic. And that's the concentration that comes out of the bottle. Um, but at 5%, um, it was not ototoxic. And based on that, the authors um, suggest it may be okay to use iodine prep in a patient with an open tympanic membrane as long as the ear is irrigated out uh, towards the beginning of surgery. Gentian violet. Um, this is kind of an interesting um, medication with a, a long history. It was first synthesized in 1861 in France as a dye. Um, and it was found by um, a Dr. Graham to stain certain type of bacteria. And it's um, used for the Graham stain, which carries his name. Um, it was first used as an antiseptic or antibiotic in the 1890s by an ophthalmologist. Uh, it can be applied topically in the office and is long lasting. Animal studies do demonstrate uh, significant ototoxicity, however, if it's applied into the middle ear. So its use in uh, tympanic membrane perforations should be limited. Notably, as anybody who's used it knows, it can stain skin and clothing, and patients should be warned about that. A uh, number of different topical antifungals have been used. There aren't a particular ear preparation of an antifungal. Um, but clotrimazole cream or myconazole cream are popular um, choices. Uh, there's a limited data on human ototoxicity, but an animal study found no ototoxicity for commonly used um, antifungals such as clotrimazole, myconazole, and nystatin. Topical anti-inflammatories. Um, there are quite a few different steroids available, which are listed by strength in the table on the right. Uh, nonetheless, 
left, I tried to highlight some of the more commonly utilized ones. Um, hydrocortisone cream is over the counter. Um, a little bit stronger in prescription would be triamcinolone. Uh, FDA has approved Dermotic for topical therapy to the ear. It's a mixture of peanut oil and fluocinolone steroid. Um, a non-steroid option would be tacrolimus, which is used extensively in dermatology for eczema. Um, it has the benefit of um, not having the same risk of skin atrophy that topical steroids can have. Topical powders, um, this is another kind of broad category. Um, there are quite a few different topical powders that have been used over the years. Um, there isn't one that's commercially available um, or FDA approved, as far as I know. Um, these are typically made by compounding pharmacies, depending upon the recipe of um, whatever surgeon is um, prescribing them. Um, they're often applied with the powder insufflator, which was developed by Dr. House and Sheehy in the 1980s. Um, on the right here, I've got a picture of the house uh, powders as they're used in clinic. Uh, most commonly used one here is CSFHC, which is a combination of um, two antibiotics and antifungal and a steroid. Moving on to drops, um, so cortisporin is one of the earliest antibiotic drops that was used in the ear. It's a mixture of neomycin, polymyxin, and hydrocortisone. Uh, neomycin is one of the oldest aminoglycosides and it's largely effective, although there are some resistant strains of pseudomonas. Um, you may remember back from medical school, aminoglycosides are a bactericidal antibiotic that work by disrupting protein synthesis at the 30S ribosomal subunit. Um, polymyxin, the other component, is a cationic detergent that disrupts the bacterial cell membrane, and hydrocortisone is an anti-inflammatory. So the question about, is cortisporin ototoxic? Um, so we all know aminoglycosides are ototoxic, and they're used in that effect in the form of um, gentamicin injections to um, kind of destroy inner ear function. Um, some patients are more susceptible to aminoglycoside ototoxicity than others based on genetic differences. Um, there have been a handful of animal studies of cortisporin that have demonstrated ototoxicity. Um, however, there are only a few case reports over several decades of use that have demonstrated hearing loss or vestibular dysfunction with cortisporin use. And talking to um, experienced uh, clinicians, this was used for decades, including packing um, in gel foam in the middle ear, and there's little to no um, significant damage to the ear. Um, there was quite a few retrospective studies which confirmed that there was no significant hearing loss for short duration of use, and there was actually a randomized controlled trial um, where cortisporin was applied to one ear and floxin to the other, and they also found no difference in hearing. Um, cortisporin. Um, However, isn't uh, great for another reason as well, on top of the ototoxicity. There's, patients can develop a contact dermatitis or type 4 hypersensitivity reaction to the neomycin component. And one study found this to be as um, frequent as 32% of patients. Patients will have a gravity dependent erythema, um, edema, pain, and it can be confused persistent infection, um, but it will often clear up with discontinuation of the cortisporin. Fluoroquinolones are the next major um, ear therapy um, and antibiotic that have been used. Um, they were first introduced in 1962, and early um, reports of topical use in the ear were from the 1980s, with more widespread use in randomized trials in the 1990s. Um, Ofloxacin, 0.3% is the most common preparation. Uh, and these are FDA approved for topical use in the middle ear, um, as they are not phototoxic. Adding a steroid to that um, in the form of Cipro HC or Cipro dexamethasone, Ciprodex, uh, has been shown in studies to be superior to cortisporin or superior to the antibiotics alone at treating otitis externa or tympanosomy tube otorrhea. Um, so the um, latest drop, Ciprodex, is um, favored for that reason. Um, and it can provide faster symptomatic relief for patients um, due to the anti-inflammatory and antibiotic effects. 
uh, Ciprodex was approved in 2003 um, and is currently off patent and there is a generic that has been approved. However, it doesn't appear to be widely available. Um, there were two studies last year looking at the um, high cost of odic drops, comparing it to ophthalmic drops, as well as trending the cost of odic drops over time. Um, on the table on the right here, you can see the um, pricing of various odic drops. Um, the middle column has the price per milliliter. And um, for whatever reason, the ophloxus and odic preparation is $31 per milliliter on average compared to the uh, same medication in the ophthalmic preparation, which is a third as much, $11 per milliliter. Uh, many of the other drops are also quite expensive with the exception of acetic acid, which is um, essentially just white vinegar and it's um, quite, an, quite inexpensive. Here's a nice graph from one of those papers I thought was interesting. It shows that the price of Ciprodex or Cipro HC um, has doubled since 2012. Um, despite not having any significant changes in the um, research or effectiveness of that. Um, for comparison, I show the price per gram or price per milliliter of some precious metals. And you can see the price for Ciprodex is um, just about right in between the price of platinum and gold. Um, so why is Ciprodex so expensive? It continues to be um, a monopoly despite generics being available. Um, the company Novartis, who um, produces Ciprodex um, in the last calendar year, earned uh, $450 million on that product. Um, this brings us to kind of the next phase of my talk. Um, given the high cost and subsequent limited availability of Ciprodex for some patients and potential odor toxicity of alternatives, what else is out there? Um, ear disease is not new and has required treatment for millennia. What remedies are available prior to the modern antibiotic area, era? And is there any rational basis for any of these therapies? Some methods um, are performed to review of ancient and medieval manuscripts, identified sections regarding ear pathology and recommended treatments, and reviewed current literature about the potential benefits of the prescribed treatments. And they also reviewed old textbooks. Brief timeline of what we're going to be talking about for the next phase of the talk. Um, starting in ancient Egypt and then looking at Greece, Rome, India, England, um, Persia, and pre-modern um, medicine. So starting in ancient Egypt, uh, civilization ran from about 4000 BC to 300 BC when Alexander the Great invaded. Uh, their medical system was um, known in the Mediterranean for having a high degree of specialization with ophthalmologists, dentists, and specialists from many other areas. Uh, the recommendation for ear pain was an ointment with labdanum. Uh, so labdanum is a rock rose plant resin. At the time it was harvested um, by goat herds who would um, use a comb to scrape the resin off of their goat's beards and they could form that into a uh, patty and paste that could be used for um, medicinal purposes. Uh, Labdanum has been tested in modern laboratories and found to have antibacterial properties. Um, so this may have been an early effective treatment for rotatus externa or um, ear infections. They recommend differently for a discharging ear, prepare for a powder to dry the wound, um, the juice of acacia, juice of Sisyphus, and the fruit of a willow. And you might remember that willow is the source of aspirin. Um, so this probably had some anti-inflammatory effect and, and may have provided uh, symptomatic relief for the patients. Moving on, looking at the ancient Greeks, um, Hippocrates um, was around 400 BC. He's known as the father of medicine, most famous for his um, Hippocratic Oath and the Four Humor Theory of Disease. Um, the Hippocratic Corpus is a large body of written work, much of which survives to this day. It's been written likely by multiple people and not just Hippocrates himself. Um, brief mention of the anatomy and understanding of the ear at the time. Um, he writes, the external parts of the ear serve merely to increase and strengthen the sound. 
that which reaches the brain through the membrane of the tympanum is clearly what causes hearing. There's the passage by means of a foramen that conveys it to the brain, which is surrounded by meninges. So you can see it describes the external canal, the tympanic membrane, and the internal auditory canal. Um, but the anatomy is somewhat limited with no description of the middle ear bones uh, or the inner ear and limited description of the nerves. Uh, but this is an interesting um, description. So um, one recipe or recommendation after a bloody fetid pus is discharged from the ear, uh, fill a sponge with some desiccative remedy and thrust it as low as possible into the ear. Let the patient snuff up some air on in order to draw off by the nares, the humor falling on the ears and thereby prevent its return to the head. Uh, if you don't know, aron is a substance used to pro produce mucus and sneezing. Um, so I thought this is an early description of a valsalva maneuver, and he's trying to get people to sneeze and increase um, pressure in the names of the pharynx, thereby um, insufflating the middle ear, and trying to treat a um, middle ear effusion in that way. Socrates has a couple of ear self or um, topical therapy recommendations. Um, said recommend the juice of stramonium mixed with various ingredients such as sweet wine, honey, resin, myrrh, and nitre. Stramonium um, or gypsum weed contains a number of um, pharmacologically active substances, including atropine, mycosamine, scopolamine. It can cause hallucinations as well and has an anticholinergic effect. Uh, laboratory studies in the modern era have shown it has antibiotic activity against Staph aureus, but not Pseudomonas. And it also has um, some anti-inflammatory effect uh, that is on par with the effect seen in NSAIDs in a rat model. So the stramonium ear cell may have been effective at um, treating some uh, ear infections and providing symptomatic relief. Moving on. Um, take a look at Galen and the Romans. Um, so Galen was a physician and surgeon in Imperial Rome. He was the um, caretaker for the Emperor Marcus Aurelius and his family. An interesting aside, uh, Marcus Aurelius was the first emperor to decide to leave the empire to his um, children and have them rule after he passed away. Um, he named both of his sons as heirs. However, unfortunately, one of them died um, at age seven after a surgery to treat a tumor beneath his ear. And that left um, his other son, Commodus, to be the sole ruler of Rome. And Commodus is um, known as one of the worst Roman emperors in history and remembered for his debauchery and as a prime example of how absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, so this kind of botched ear surgery may have been responsible for a, um, part of the downfall of Rome. Um, Galen had a large body of work ranging from his own anatomic descriptions and case reports. Uh, his anatomy under anatomic understanding was getting a lot more sophisticated than what was present in ancient Greece. He described seven pairs of cranial nerves, um, some of which had motor and sensory divisions. Um, he described soft nerves for sensation and hard nerves for movement. Um, he had a sophisticated understanding that was based on a number of animal experiments. He's famous for one um, demonstration in which he ties up a pig in the um, town square and then performs neck surgery on it and identifies the vagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And he ties those off and proves that the nerve is responsible for the squealing of the pig and he can reverse it by um, tightening and loosening the sutures around the nerves. I'm sure the crowd was quite impressed by that demonstration. Uh, so Galen for topical ear therapies and uh, recommended quite a few different recipes, um, most of which contained myrrh, some contained honey or breast milk. Um, myrrh is a resin that comes from um, a particular species of thorny tree. It's harvested by making gashes in the bark and collecting the um, resin and sap that comes out and dries. Uh, apart from smelling nice as an incense or as a part of uh, perfumes, um, myrrh has been tested in 
modern laboratories to, been found to have antibacterial and antifungal effect. Um, the table on the right um, shows the um, various uh, portions of MER that were um, divided out, F3, F4, F5, F6, and F7, and compares the antibacterial effect of those against ciprofloxacin and the antifungal effect against amphotericin. And again, this is the MIC or the concentration of uh, the component required to inhibit growth of bacteria. And um, long story short is the um, MER has a pretty good antibacterial effect against both Pseudomonas and Staph aureus um, and requires only slightly higher concentration than that of the um, modern antibiotics. Um, here's a picture of MER resin after it's been harvested. Um, the same paper looked at the um, effect of MER on, uh, as an anesthetic. Um, so they used a rabbit model and corneal reflexes and compared MER to procaine, um, which we know is a topical um, anesthetic. and found that MER was about half as effective as procaine at limiting um, the corneal reflex, suggesting it has pretty good anesthetic properties in addition to the antibacterial and antifungal effects that we described on the last slide. So moving on the next um, major civilization and ancient medical text I wanted to talk about um, is ancient India. Um, I apologize for the pronunciation. The Sushutra Samhita is an ancient Sanskrit text. Um, it's debated by historians about when it um, was written. Um, somewhere between 1000 BC and 500 AD. The reality is probably all of that, all of those dates are accurate. And this is kind of a living document that has a lot of different versions over time with authors adding to it as uh, those years went by. Uh, a couple of interesting ear related um, excerpts from that um, text. For patients who are hearing a variety of divine sounds, such as the uproar of a city, the moaning of a sea, they should be regarded as a doomed being. It's kind of a grim, um, pretty grim prognosis for people with tinnitus, but they did have a recommended remedy um, for hissing in the ear. They said to fill the ear with a pungent oil. Um, now I'm not sure how effective that was, um, but, um, I'm not sure how different it is to what we recommend today. And we unfortunately tell patient, patients to learn to live with their tinnitus rather than having a nice um, cure for it. For earache, um, they have a long list of um, plant matter to mix in together and cook over a gentle fire. Um, and rather than going into details, I'll just say several of these um, plants that they recommend have um, antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory properties. Again, suggesting that this ear remedy probably was effective. Moving on, I wanted to next talk about um, medieval Europe. Um, so Bald's Leech Book is a compilation of English Anglo-Saxon medicine written in Old English around 950 AD. A lot of the remedies are from Greek and Roman sources, um, and it's added to with contemporary Anglo-Saxon physicians. This is one of the first books that has a nice head to toe index and organization. So it was um, fairly user friendly. People could um, identify the body part where the patient had an issue and quickly find the remedy for that um, problem. There's a lot of the supernatural as well. Um, and the book has a remedy for a salve for elves and night goblins. For ear pain, on the left, I've got the Old English, um, the translation, take hen's grease in an oyster shell, set on live coals, warm a little and drip into the ears. Soon they will be whole. Afterwards, warm the sap of coriander and the milk of a woman in the shell and drip into the ears. And so it sounds like they're cleaning the ear with chicken grease and then uh, applying a mixture of coriander and breast milk. How effective could that be? Well, coriander um, has been shown to be antibacterial, including anti-pseudomonal, and has antifungal properties as well. The active ingredient um, has been parsed out and found to be linalool and other terpenes present within the 
plant, although the exact mechanism is not known. I found an interesting um, randomized placebo controlled trial in the dermatology literature. Um, there were 35 patients with athlete's foot and they were randomized to apply uh, coriander oil cream to one foot and a placebo to the other foot. And they found a significant improvement in symptoms on the treated foot compared to the placebo foot, suggesting that antifungal um, properties of the coriander oil can have clinical relevance and not just um, antifungal effect in the lab. I don't think a similar study has been done for the ear. So Bald's Leach book, they talk about earworms. Um, to quote them, if worms are in the ears, put warm henbane sap on the worms. They will be dead and will fall off and the ears will be whole. Afterwards, bring knapweed sap or white whorehound or warm wormwood into the ears. Soon he will be well. It's unclear if the author meant actual worms or an antiquated understanding or description of disease. There are a number of case reports of actual worms or maggots in ears. And I remember a case in residency where someone had a um, terrible basal cell carcinoma that had been neglected of the, um, over the pinna and into the mastoid and required debridement of maggots. Um, however, worms um, weren't always worms as we think of them today. So in medieval and ancient medicine, Worms were thought to cause tooth decay, and it's likely um, the medical practitioners at this time thought a similar mechanism was at play in chronic ear disease, and they were describing kind of a chronically painful, chronically draining ear rather than physical worms crawling through it. Um, so in that recipe, they recommended henbane. Um, henbane is a nightshade plant, has a long history of use as a traditional medicine. It contains active alkaloids, um, including atropine and scopolamine, similar to the gymsum weed that we talked about earlier, um, which was recommended by Hippocrates. It's a bronchodilator, antisecretory, bladder relaxant, hypnotic, hallucinogenic, um, among other um, pharmacologic effects. Um, it's also antibacterial, including against Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. Um, as late as the 1890s, it was used as a traditional medicine for dental worms. Um, there was a um, case report of somebody describing a patient who was chewing on henbane seeds and got um, anticholinergic toxicity. Um, and the author reports the patient was claimed he was treating his dental worms. Um, wormwood, um, this is used in as an ingredient in absinthe and other alcoholic drinks and bitters. Um, it has both antibacterial and antifungal activity. And another study found it had um, decent anti-inflammatory activity as well. Again, suggesting that these old remedies, while it seems like just a mixture of plants, may have had um, meaningful impact on the course of disease for the patients who use them. Uh, I didn't think this talk would be complete without a brief mention of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it's a very large topic. Um, you may know um, Chinese medicine has several thousand year history and the Chinese um, understanding and description of disease processes is quite different than the Western one. Um, for otitis externa, um, they recommended clearing heat from the liver and gallbladder, eliminating dampness and subduing swelling. Um, to our Western ears, that doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense to be treating liver disease, um, but in the um, traditional Chinese understanding of medicine, uh, working on the liver is a lot more than treating the organ and the abdomen. And it has to do with the um, chi, meridians, vital life force. Um, and it's not really a fair comparison to Western medicine. Uh, found an interesting study demonstrating that acupuncture was effective at reducing acute otitis media in a randomized study in dogs. And there are a number of um, herbal remedies that exist in traditional Chinese medicine as well including a double yellow eardrop, um, which is found to be effective at treating ear infections. Uh, the next um, civilization I wanted to talk about was um, the Golden Age of Persia. Um, this is around 1000 AD. Um, the Persian heyday was around 800 to 1300 BC, or AD, I mean. Um, the book um, 
main source from the time is the Canon of Medicine by Ibn Sina. He's also known as Avicenna. Um, this was completed in 1025. It's a large textbook. Um, it was used um, as a major medical text throughout Europe through the 18th century. And it's really a remarkable compendium of um, knowledge of the time and really shows how sophisticated the um, academic and medical community was in Persia in that time period. Um, this description um, I thought was worth going over. Um, he writes, if the stoppage of discharge from the ear produces vertigo in a man, it can be removed by restoring the discharge. It should be noted that to leave behind a little of morbid matter is less injurious than to strive to deplete it so outright and vigorously as to cause debility. And it's hard to know exactly what he was talking about, but to my modern uh, ear doctor um, ears, it sounds like he's describing a clustiotoma, which has a horizontal canal fistula, and he's recommending removing um, the majority of the clustiotoma, but leaving behind matrix over the um, horizontal canal to prevent um, leakage of fluid and um, causing a dead ear. Now, again, like I said, there's no way to know for sure if that's what he's talking about. But if it is, it's a pretty sophisticated understanding and knowledge of the um, effects of treatment and the um, recommendation is not that far off from best practices today. Um, for Odoria, um, this book recommends introducing into the ear a wick dipped in honey or wine containing a small quantity of alum or saffron or nitre. Um, Alum or nitre are both astringent and antiseptic, uh, do have antibiotic properties. Another recommendation was for berberis um, and uh, several other plants and myrrh, um, boiled in oil and dropped into the ear. So we already discussed how myrrh was effective. Uh, berberis um, plant, which is pictured in the top right, has antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory effects. Um, Persian understanding of anatomy was really quite sophisticated. A um, couple diagrams on the right. The upper one shows the um, facial and temporal artery and its branches. Um, and the lower one shows a detailed anatomic drawing of the um, optic nerves and optic chiasm. And their numbering system for cranial nerves is different than ours today, um, but it's remarkably accurate in their descriptions of the functions of the nerves. Um, they write the fourth nerve has taste, um, which in our understanding is cranial nerve seven, the quarter tympani. Um, fifth nerve has hearing, um, cranial nerve eight. Um, they have a detailed description of how hearing works. Um, it's caused by undulations of air compressed between two impinging bodies. Air is thrown into waves. It imparts movement to the air, which is stationary in the auditory meatus. Um, it reaches this nerve and gives rise to the sensation of hearing. Uh, the sixth pair of cranial nerves they describe breaking into three branches and coming from the same foramen, which is in the modern understanding is the jugular foramen. And they describe how one branch goes to the muscles of the pharynx and the root of the tongue, which would be the glossopharyngeal nerve. The second branch goes to the scapular muscle and flat muscle of the shoulder. Uh, accessory nerve, and the third branch goes to the viscera and to the larynx, the vagus nerve. And they have accurate descriptions of the functions of the recurrent and external branches of the original nerve. Uh, kind of fast forward quite a bit. Like I said, the um, Persian textbook was used throughout Europe through the 1800s. Um, there is a lot of um, medicine and scientific advancements through the um, Renaissance, um, but in the uh, interest of time, I'm moving on to the kind of the pre-modern era. Uh, Kramer in Germany has a textbook from 1863. Um, it's translated into English at that time and published in the um, UK and in the US. Um, for acute otitis externa, he recommends olive oil and the sulfate of zinc, um, which is an astringent, probably somewhat effective. And for chronic external ear inflammation, um, as was popular at the time, he recommends it was indispensable that the bowels should be kept freely open um, using Fowler's solution of arsenic. Um, he also recommended powdering the surface of the ear with lycopodi. 
Um, so lycopodium um, is a genus of club moss that produces spores that um, form a fine white powder. Um, it has many uses in traditional medicine. Um, it's been tested and found to have antibacterial and anti-inflammatory effect. Um, the table on the right shows uh, it's an excerpt from one of the, these papers. Um, the first row here is the um, lycopodium, and it compares it to the effect of ampicillin, ofoxacin, mevofloxacin for antibacterial activity and for ketoconazole and fluconazole um, against candida. And while the concentration of lycopodium required to inhibit growth of these pathogens is higher than that of the antibiotics tested, um, it does inhibit growth and has um, meaningful antibiotic effect. And like we had discussed earlier, the topical application can achieve very high concentrations. Um, it's kind of an interesting material. Um, it's hydrophobic, very fine, and it's used in a lot of different uh, kind of science demonstrations and used in special effects to create explosions. Um, next textbook I wanted to talk about was written by Buck at the New York Eye, Ear, Eye and Ear Institute in 1880. Um, for ear infections, he recommended silver nitrate, sulfate of zinc, and acetate of lead, which are all astringents. Um, there were quite a few lead-based um, ointments and treatments that he did at the time. And interestingly, um, lead paste was used um, back then, similar to how we use zinc ointment today as kind of a diaper cream and cure-all rash um, ointment. Unfortunately, it was also regularly used um, for chafed uh, nipples for breastfeeding mothers, um, which I'm sure didn't help the um, newborns who were breastfeeding. Um, he recommended it um, similar to um, Kramer Fowler's solution of arsenic, um, a powdered iodoform, um, which is probably effective as well as carbolic acid, an acidifying agent. He discusses how important um, oral toilet and ear care is in cleaning out and treating infections and has some diagrams of the instruments used, including this um, kind of curved cotton holder with a mop of cotton, not dissimilar to the um, cotton swabs we use today. Moving ahead, um, next textbook um, edited by Jackson. The chapter was written by William Gill, 1945. Um, for ear infections, he discusses the value of Staphylococcus bacteriophages. So that was kind of a um, popular and fad treatment in the era. Um, bacteriophages were viruses. They weren't really known as viruses at the time, but it was a um, compound that was found in the um, lab to be very effective at killing particular strains of bacteria. And they were used throughout the um, 1920s through 40s um, and beyond really as uh, attempted antibacterial effect. Um, they were quite effective in um, vitro, but in vivo, the um, topically applied or injected bacteriophages didn't really have an effect, um, which over the decades was learned. He also recommended um, for ear infections, the Rowentgen ray or radiation therapy. Um, this was popular for most any disease you could think of at the time, including acne, uh, adenoid hypertrophy, and apparently ear infections. Um, he recommended a gentian violet, which as we had discussed is still used today. Um, and he had the recipe for a compounded sulfur ointment, um, sulfur being an antibiotic that was still used today and as part of the CSF powder that we use at House Clinic. Um, makes mention of antibiotics such as penicillin or at the present commanding great attention and may be said to occupy the center of the therapeutic stage. Their use while still in its infancy gives great promise. And the beginning of the antibiotic era. Um, for fungal otitis, he recommends cleaning, applying a wick, followed by the oil of cloves and quercetin and olive oil. Um, quercetin was a popular um, medication used by dentists at the time. It was thought to have antibacterial and um, numbing effect. Um, however, studies over the subsequent decades found it to be largely ineffective. Uh, the diagram from the textbook is on the right, demonstrating application of an earwick made of cotton or lamb wool, and he describes how it can be quite painful for the patient. Different 1947 textbook 
um, again recommended um, astringent, stringent violet, and ultraviolet rays or a radiation with the um, Rowentgen ray. Moving ahead to 1965, um, Dr. Hammond recommended um, eardrops of neomycin and hydrocortisone. They are often effective in clearing up the infection at this stage, but they're not advocated because of the occurrence of neomycin sensitivity. Um, so we've kind of now entered the um, modern antibiotic era of topical ear therapies. And for fungal infections, similar to today, he recommended nystatin, powder or ointment, or amphotericin lotion. So that, that concludes the kind of whirlwind tour of um, eardrops from ancient times to today. Um, ear diseases are common and always have been Modern treatment is usually effective, but has potential odor toxicity and can be expensive and difficult for some patients to obtain. A number of pre-modern and ancient treatments may have been effective as well and warrant further study. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.